Okay, well, hi everyone. I think we're gonna get going. Um, so we have a lot of ground to cover. There's gonna be some really interesting material that we're gonna take a look at. Most of it today though is going to be sort of uh, background. It's also just going to be setting up for the rest of the course. We're gonna be talking about some of the basic membrane properties. And along the way, I'll try to make sure that you understand how this one lecture is setting up for future lectures that we're gonna need in order to have a really great conversation in neurophysiology. So with that said, I'm gonna start sharing my screen and hopefully uh, we'll be able to get through most of what I need to talk to you about today. And um, hopefully it'll be in a manner that is easy for you to understand. So let's, let's just dive right in. All right, so I think I'm actually gonna try changing um, my uh, laser pointer to a slightly different color. We're going to start using this red one here. So today we're going to be talking about membranes as well as uh, different proteins that are found within these membranes. These are going to be incredibly important discussions as we go along. Um, and I hope that uh, even though it might sound really basic, that you'll understand why it's a critical lecture. So today we're going to go through a whole bunch of um, background lectures on the cell membrane, about cell membrane permeability, the different forms of cell membrane permeability as is outlined for you in these four little bullet points. One of the key proteins that allows for permeability of uh, water-soluble products, including channels, and the different subcategories of these different channels that are found within the membrane, as well as some of the regulation of some of these different uh, membrane proteins, including endocytosis as well as exocytosis. And then we'll begin our discussion today about the membrane potential and how that membrane potential is set up. So to begin with, when we look at the cell membrane and we have a diagram that I'm sure many of you have seen several different times in your university career, is that this is not sort of an inert bag that is found on the outside of a cell holding it together, but in fact, this cell membrane is actually comprised of this phospholipid bilayer. And this phospholipid bilayer that you are seeing over here actually uh, confers some really specific properties to this membrane. So one, it allows anything that is lipid soluble. Things that are fats and lipids can freely pass through this membrane. They don't need any extra help. Gases also can diffuse readily through this uh, cell membrane as well. What makes this unique though is that the vast majority of the substances that we need to consider in this course as well as in other courses are water soluble materials and they cannot get across this uh, phospholipid bilayer or this cell membrane without some help. And that's what we're gonna be talking about in a little bit. So this means that when we look at this cell membrane, because water soluble molecules can't cross, that the cell membrane is impermeable to different types of organic anions like proteins and for um, different types of charged particles uh, like ions, we need to have this consideration as well. So this permeability, this ability to move across this membrane depends on the molecular size of the molecule that we're looking at, its lipid solubility, is it lipid soluble or not, as well as if it is carrying a charge. So this notion that if a substance can cross the membrane through any means, so if it is going through directly by itself or if it's using a protein to help it go across, we say that the membrane is permeable to that particular substance. So gases, for example, are fully permeable because they can diffuse across the membrane without any help. And then different polar molecules and ions can become permeable or can cross this membrane uh, through the use of different types of proteins. And these proteins can consist of a number of different types of molecules. So these proteins that help increase the permeability or its ability to get across include things like channels, as well as carrier proteins to help these different substances or polar molecules to cross this membrane. So this can occur in a number of different ways. So very uh, easy to understand is simple diffusion where we have small lipid soluble molecules and gases. Uh, things like O2, O2, CO2, ethanol, urea can pass directly through the phospholipid bilayer or they can actually pass through small pores that exist within the lipid membrane itself. The movement through simple diffusion is uh, down its concentration gradient. So this symbol again, just as a reminder, is about concentration gradient. And the relative rate, how quickly this diffusion occurs, is also proportional to the concentration gradient that exists on one side of the membrane versus the other. 
important in this consideration is that this form of movement, this form of permeability, this simple diffusion is passive. No energy is going to be required in the form of using up any ATP. Now we're going to see in a few moments that not all forms of permeability, not all uh, protein carrier molecules um, are going to have this same passive property. Another one, though, that does have this passive property is known as facilitated diffusion. So this is another way to get a molecule across this membrane. And here is a membrane here in purple running straight through from top to bottom. And this facilitated diffusion is a process of diffusion where molecules can cross this membrane. Normally, they would not be able to cross the membrane, but they are able to do so with the assistance of a carrier protein that is found embedded within this phospholipid bilayer. So this carrier protein is going to aid in the movement of different polar molecules, so ones that are charged or have polarity associated with them. They are not lipid soluble. And things like um, different sugars as well as amino acids will be able to cross this membrane through the use of these different types of carrier molecules, which you are seeing here. Now here, again, there is a difference because we have a concentration difference or a concentration gradient. We have much more of the molecule on one side versus the other. And this concentration gradient of this solute, this polar molecule that is using facilitated diffusion, is supplying the energy. So this, again, is a passive form of, uh, of carrying the molecule across. No energy input is going to be required. And no ATP is going to be used in this process. Now, this is radically different than active transport. So if we want to move molecules against their uh, concentration gradient, we still need a protein, and we still need a way for it to traverse the uh, phospholipid bilayer. But this active transport mechanism is used for different types of molecules to move across the cell membrane against their concentration gradient. Normally, things go from high concentration to low concentration. But using active transport, we can move molecules from low concentration to high concentration. So the substrate protein uh, or the substrate will bind to the protein carrier. This protein carrier, just as we saw in example number two, is going to change the protein conformation to help to move this substrate, whatever it is, it could be an ion, it could be another substance, um, across the membrane. This is active and it requires energy that is supplied through the breakdown or the hydrolysis of the molecule ATP. And as a result of this, most active transport properties that we'll look at within the nervous system uh, involve these ATPases, and particularly the sodium potassium ATPase, also known as the sodium potassium pump. These are working against their normal concentrations, requiring the formation, uh, requiring the uh, use of ATP. A fourth type of movement which is known as secondary active transport, is when a substance is carried against its concentration gradient, but it does not require the uh, breakdown of ATP, and this is secondary active transport. So the kinetic energy of moving one substance down its concentration gradient uh, will provide enough of the energy that is going to allow for that same carrier molecule to transport against the concentration gradient of a different molecule. And so these secondary transporters, the ones that are using that um, energy, that kinetic energy of one molecule, is really just going along for the ride. It's going on the coattails of that primary active transport system. So this secondary molecule that's being transported, they themselves do not require ATP. They're just going along for the ride. And so this secondary active transport system is not a true form of active transport in the traditional sense. So this sequential binding of a substrate and ions to specific sites on, this, on these transporter uh, proteins still involves a conformational change, which means that it's changing its shape. And as it does so, it allows for these different molecules to cross uh, this membrane. And again, this active transport is being powered by that kinetic or chemical energy of an ion or molecule flowing down its normal concentration gradient. And this allows for another different molecule to be pushed against its uh, concentration gradient going from low to high concentration. All right, so we've had a number of different examples of different types of movement across this
phospholipid bilayer, and we've looked at simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, active transport, and secondary active transport mechanisms. And again, just to highlight this last one, the molecule that's going along for the ride does not require um, active uh, use of energy or ATP. All right, so hopefully uh, that was a quick review for you. Um, I'd love feedback at any point in time. Am I going too fast? Am I going too slow? Um, hopefully I'm going at the right pace for the vast majority of you, but I'd love to get that feedback. One of the other um, molecules that we talked about was uh, the proteins that form these channels. Now, this molecule that you see over here on the right um, in this diagram is actually a really important molecule. We're going to get to that in a moment. Um, by the time we get to slides numbers uh, 15 and 14 and 15, you'll see why this is important. But we have these channels that are also found within the membrane. So this blue sort of square or rectangle that you see here represents the membrane, the outside um, extracellular environment, the intracellular environment. And embedded, we have this membrane-spanning protein. And this membrane-spanning protein, because it is fully traversing the, mem the plasma membrane, is going to form a pore. And this pore, because of all of these different subunits that make up this one um, transporter uh, or this channel uh, include uh, different regions like the S1 region, that's one subunit, uh, the S2 subunit, S3, the S4, S5, uh, there is a pore loop, and this S6 region. So specific ions will be able to make use of these different types of channels, and these are very important within the nervous system. And these pore loops that you are seeing here between S5 and S6, um, they actually uh, hang uh, outside of the, the channel a little bit. They also uh, dangle a little bit inside the channel as well. And some of these different pore loops actually provide a selectivity filter. And these selectivity filters might be specific for an ion. So for example, between S5 and S6, there might be a pore loop that only allows sodium ions to flow through. Um, and that means that based on the size of the sodium ion, as well as the charge on the sodium ion, this pore loop between S5 and S6 will determine what types of ions go through. Again, these are membrane channels, very important in our discussion. And it's a good slide for you to spend a little bit of time on because you're gonna see this several times throughout this particular lecture. So these membrane channels, if you wanna think of a wall being the plasma membrane, these channels, these membrane channels, would be very much like having a door that can open and close and allow different people to walk into and out uh, or go through that wall. And normally you wouldn't be able to, but using the door, you would be able to. And these doors, if the analogy is holding for you, and these doors represent the membrane channels, these membrane channels are not open all the time. They're not usually kept open perpetually or all the time, and these can be closed off. And this ability for these doors to be closed off or these channels to be closed off is because there are a number of protein structures which function as what we call a gate. So many of these channels have protein structures embedded within them, that allow them to function as gates. And these gates can open and close. And when the gate is closed, that channel will no longer allow for ions to go through it. No diffusion will take place. And if the gate is open, the channel is open, and then diffusion will be allowed. Remembering that it is still selective. That domain, that pore loop between S5 and S6 allows what type of ion to flow through. It's not just anything that can go through that open door. It's a members only club, if you wanna think of it that way. The protein components will switch between this open and closed configuration. The open configuration um, with those uh, protein branches will allow for an open pore, and the other one, when it's closed, will block that pore. And the factors that determine whether or not a channel protein will uh, be able to change its shape depends a lot on the type of channel that we're looking at. So again, these channels can be either opened or closed, and they can open and close because of different types of factors. If the factor is a chemical agent or a neurotransmitter, we call these ligand-gated channels, and that will open and close it. That will activate or close a gate. 
and voltage gated channels, the voltage across the membrane, and that may or may not make, make a lot of sense for you at this point in time, we're gonna to get to that in a few minutes, this voltage across the membrane will allow for this channel to open as well as close. Now this second concept is a little bit harder to understand, but I'm going to try to go through it with you slowly over the next few slides, but first we're gonna go and visit what happens with the ligand gated channel. So these ligand gated channels, again, we're taking a look at a cell in two dimensions here, but you can imagine this round shape would represent the entire cell. Here is a uh, ligand gated channel on the cell membrane. Um, and these cell membrane receptors are a really important part of many different body systems. And the binding of the receptor with its ligand, whatever that ligand would be, it could be a neurotransmitter, it could be a hormone, it could be a number of different things, will result in something happening inside the cell. So it could be a change in the shape of the, ch of the channel itself, and that might allow for an ion to pass through freely, or it might lead to the um, activation of intracellular messengers, but something will happen inside the cell in these ligand-gated channels if we take a look at them. They're a little bit different than these voltage-gated channels. So these voltage-gated channels shown to you in a slightly different way. So think back to that earlier diagram that I showed you earlier that had S1 all the way through to S6. And this is more of a three-dimensional structure associated with it. And if you looked very, very closely at what I was showing you earlier on, there was one of those transmembrane domains called the S4. And this S4 has a unique structure where it kind of branches off on both sides um, that you are looking at here. So we're looking at um, an S4 associated with this part of the channel, and we have another S4 with this part. The S1s through S6s are all sitting here. The S1s and S6s are all sitting here as well on the opposite side. And here would be that pore that you were looking at. And so one of the important things, again, we have this selectivity filter, only certain ions will be able to pass through. So some of these membrane channels, and you can see that normally under resting conditions when nothing is happening, there's no stimulus, we would have positive charges on the outside of the plasma membrane, this is outside the cell, and inside the cell we would have um, negative charges, we have this polarization, in other words, a charge difference across this membrane at rest. We're gonna to try to understand that in a few minutes. But this means that at this configuration, this particular voltage-gated channel is closed and it is currently shut. And this S4 um, subunit is sort of uh, sitting off to the side. And this is the voltage sensing mechanism, this fourth transmembrane domain, um, that S4 segment, the uh, fourth transmembrane domain or the S4 segment is the one that is sensitive to changes in the voltage across the membrane. So the S4 sticks out to the side of this channel um, on both sides here, much like a wing, as you can see. The natural position for this wing is to be in the upwards position. So its normal position is sort of uh, floating upwards. Uh, it wants to go up this way, and this is where my pointer is hopefully working for all of you. But when this membrane is polarized as it is right now, these wings are kind of attracted downwards because they have a number of positive charges, they are actually attracted to the net negative charge inside the membrane, which is why the wings are kind of in this down position, moving toward that negatively charged inner surface. Hope you're all with me so far. Hope you're uh, really clear on that. And hopefully if you do have questions, we'll be able to take those up maybe in our Thursday session. So what happens next is that under certain conditions, we will actually have a change in the polarity. We will have, for example, instead of having positive outside the cell, as was in the previous case, uh, we might have positive inside the cell. And this depolarization, in the case of depolarization, if we had positive charges now inside the cell, these would repel the S4 transmembrane domains. And as a result, this electrical attraction downwards doesn't exist and there's a slight repulsion. So they go back to its normal upwards configuration where they want to be. And these would open up the channel, as you can see here, and this would allow through the selectivity pore, the movement of an ion down its concentration gradient. Critically, or very importantly, that net movement of um, 
ions still has to be down its concentration gradient. All right, so this is again when we can look at these voltage gated channels. Another key process in maintaining all of the different structures, including channels and other structures on that plasma membrane that we began with earlier on, is this process of endocytosis and exocytosis. And endocytosis is the inward pinching of the plasma membrane to create a structure which is known as a vesicle. And this is usually in the form of receptor-mediated endocytosis, where we can remove proteins from the cell surface and move them into the cell. And this is very, very common. Versus exocytosis, where we get a partial or complete fusion of some of these intracellular vesicles to the plasma membrane or with the plasma membrane. And this often allows for bulk membrane transport. It allows receptors and other proteins that we need on the cell surface to be transported up there um, as from going from intracellular to extracellular stores. So these processes of exocytosis, for example, of moving intracellular vesicle, uh, intracellular materials that are packaged within these vesicles um, can either be secreted or delivered to the plasma membranes in two different ways or two main ways that we look at in exocytosis. And these require different types of proteins that are involved in docking, um, where they are either meeting up and fusing completely or where they are uh, just changing um, their configuration enough to meet the plasma membrane. So exocytosis one is a more rapid mechanism and this has been dubbed kiss and run. And I'll go through that in the next slide. And the other mechanism is known as exocytosis two or full um, exocytosis. So if we look at exocytosis one, so we would have these vesicles that are being formed that are carrying cargo as well as neurotransmitters or other chemical substances. And here you can see these little dots represent these um, different types of uh, neurotransmitters that might be found here. And in this kiss and run, these specialized vesicles known as secretory vesicles. So this isn't necessarily for bulk transport. This is for secretion. Uh, these will dock with and fuse with the plasma membrane at very specific locations, uh, which are known as fusion pore regions on the plasma membrane. So it doesn't happen randomly, only specific areas where this can occur. And these vesicles run up to and fuse with the uh, fusion pore region several times, and then they might um, move away again. They're not completely empty, and then they might move their way back to another region. Um, to begin that part again. And since only part of the contents are emptied in one of these brief um, types of fusion events, which is known as a kiss, the process um, will only release some of the contents. And this has to be repeated several times in order for this vesicle to be completely um, emptied or to be completely depleted. Generally, only part of the vesicle contents diffuse into the um, interstitial fluid or outside of the cell. Um, and this is used for low rates of signaling. When we need small amounts of neurotransmitter or hormones or other types of things, we would use this kiss and run. We don't need to empty out the entire contents of the secretory vesicle all at once. Hope that's clear. Hope that's uh, good for you so far. Um, it's now a good time if you're getting a little overwhelmed to kind of pause and stop and maybe uh, take a little bit of a break and then we'll uh, continue on if you're good uh, with exocytosis, but feel free at any time to pause and stop. So for exocytosis too, this is full exocytosis. This is complete fusion of the vesicle. Everything is fused. As you can see, it's coming from the Golgi apparatus. This has a number of different proteins that are found on here. This is also going to be useful for bulk transport. There are very, very specific sites in which this can also bind. These regions are known as exocyst regions, so a little bit different than the fusion pores that we looked at. And at these regions, these particular types of vesicles will completely fuse with the membrane um, and it will allow for the complete delivery of membrane proteins. This is used when we need to release a lot of different things at the same time. This is high levels of signaling. And in order for this membrane not to keep continually grow bigger and bigger, we also need to um, have endocytosis to recover the uh, portions of the vesicle membrane that have now been fused with the plasma membrane. And this endocytosis also occurs in a dynamin, which is a protein 
dependent fashion that allows for recovery of those vesicles and potentially for receptor mediated endocytosis and involving like clathrin to allow for a homeostasis or counterbalancing of all of the exocytosis that's going on. All right, hopefully you're still with me. We're almost to the end of today's section. I know it's um, a little bit heavy, but um, hopefully it's not too bad so far. So we'll get to some of these other basic properties, including the membrane potential. So strangely, if you were to actually measure any particular cell, all cells in the body um, actually generate a membrane potential. Um, we do have electrical fields around all cells. It's not just neurons. It's not just things that are found in the nervous system or things that are found within the brain. And in order to generate these membrane potentials, we only need two basic conditions. We need a concentration gradient and we need a semi-permeable membrane. Now, why do we need both of these two different things? So to create a concentration gradient is important because remember things move down their concentration gradients most of the time. But when we look very carefully within the nervous system and in areas where we have these membrane potentials, usually there is an ion pump, and this is usually going to require energy in the form of ATP, so we have an ATPase. And it must be able to transport certain ion species that carry a potential or carry a charge along with them across this membrane to create that concentration gradient. So setting up a concentration gradient requires these sodium uh, requires these ATPases. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Now, if that was the only thing, it wouldn't work out very well because we also need a semi-permeable membrane. Once we've set up these different concentration gradients, we need to keep those ions apart because normally they'd want to diffuse down their concentration gradients. And these semi-permeable membranes allow one ion species to diffuse across the membrane much more easily than others. And that's why it's permeable but it's only permeable to some ions or it's more permeable to some ions than it is to others. And the diffusion of that ion species that is more permeable at rest down its concentration gradient is what is going to uh, create this electrical gradient that we can measure on cells, which is known as the membrane potential. Again, there's a lot of stuff that we just covered there and there might be some uh, things that you need to unpack. Spend that time to uh, go through this slide again, make sure that you're clear with these different concepts. So to set up this concentration gradient, let's take a look at the one that we use the most often within the nervous system. And this would be the sodium potassium ATPase, the sodium potassium pump, and all, all cell membranes are actually loaded with these sodium potassium ATPases or these sodium potassium pumps. This is one of the prime staples or one of the most common types of proteins that we find within living cells. And this sodium potassium dependent ATPase is this enzyme which moves three sodium ions out of the cell and two potassium ions into the cell. And in the process, because it requires energy, that transporter is moving things against their concentration gradients, we require the breakdown of this ATP. And so for each ATP uh, broken down, three sodium um, ions are pumped out, meaning there's going to be more and more sodium outside the cell, and two potassiums are going to be pumped in, meaning that there's going to be more and more potassium inside the cell. And this is going to create a concentration difference for these different ions. Now, how important is this? A third of your body's energy needs. So as you're sitting there at rest and your body is generating all this heat through the mitochondria, all of that energy that's being uh, generated by your mitochondria, a third of all of that energy is actually going toward the maintenance of the sodium potassium ATP. Remarkable if you think about that. Just, just think about how much food you're ingesting just to maintain the sodium potassium um, ATP uh, A's function. Uh, in neurons though, it's even more dramatic. So it's about two thirds of all of the energy expenditure within the brain, two thirds of that goes towards maintaining this sodium potassium ATPase. It's a huge consumer of energy. And in fact, we know in stroke, where we lose activity of the sodium potassium pump, things actually happen dramatically as a, re as a result of no longer being able to maintain this concentration uh, difference. And this difference that occurs, this sodium potassium uh, 
inequality leads to generally a small difference in charge, which we call a potential difference, of about minus 10 millivolts across the cell membrane. So it's slightly more negative inside with respect to outside, which is why we have it at minus 10. And that's just through to the movement of three sodium out, two potassiums in. But our resting membrane potential should be about minus 10. So if only sodium and potassium and this ATPase, and we only had this semi-permeable membrane and it eventually equilibrated, it should be minus 10. And those are the only two things that we talked about. But when we measure the actual resting membrane potential in neurons, it's actually not minus 10, it's much closer to minus 70 millivolts. And the key question is, why is this resting membrane potential minus 70 and not minus 10? So it can't just be sodium potassium ATPase, it can't just be having a semi-permeable phospholipid membrane, something else has to be occurring. So if the resting membrane potential is closer to minus 70, something else is obviously happening, and this is going to be due to the diffusion of these potassium ions outward. Remember I had talked about semi-permeable membranes being really important. So this diffusion of potassium ions outward, even though we've set up a concentration gradient, the, these potassium ions can actually leave through this membrane. Now, think about that for a second. Just remember what I told you earlier about charged particles moving across a phospholipid bilayer that can't happen. But we know that these are diffusing outward, and this resting membrane is most permeable to potassium ions. That's why it's semi-permeable at rest. It's more permeable to potassium ions. And these potassium ions flows out of the cell, down its concentration gradient. So remember, this is normally high inside the cell, low outside, so it is going down its concentration gradient. And they're doing so because there are these leak potassium channels that allow for potassium ions to flow through. Eventually, as these potassium ions leave, these potassium ions are positively charged cations, so they'll begin to accumulate on the outside of the membrane, and because they are positive and they're carrying positive charge outside of the cell, that means they're going to leave a net negativity inside of the cell. And this efflux, in order to explain this resting membrane potential where we have this concentration gradient, this efflux will occur until there is such a big buildup of potassium outside of the cell membrane that no further diffusion can actually occur. Potassium actually starts repelling itself as it accumulates outside of the membrane. And here, we will reach what is known as an equilibrium situation for this one particular ion. Um, and again, just showing you that eventually we reach this equilibrium where we, even though there is still a large concentration gradient, there's enough positive charge being left outside, more negative charge inside, that this positive ion is actually not as compelled to leave as it normally would. So this brings up this notion of what we call an equilibrium potential. At this equilibrium condition that we've just talked about for potassium, there is going to be electrical work that is required to repel this cation outward, and that's going to be balanced by the chemical work of diffusion down its concentration gradient, which we just talked about in the previous slides. And the membrane potential where we reach this equilibrium value is going to be determined by the concentration difference um, of the ion that we're looking at. And we can actually calculate this mathematically using what is known as the Nernst equation. So we can calculate the membrane potential, the voltage, that is going to be dependent on this concentration. And let me show that to you in the next slide, or in the slide after this one. So in an ideal situation, this Nernst equation will de describe the balance between the chemical work of diffusion due to the concentration difference, and the fact that this ion carries a charge means that eventually, as it starts to accumulate in one compartment, it's going to start repelling um, it from further diffusing out. And this means that the electrical work of repulsion is going to come into place. And so this equation gives this membrane difference um, across the membrane uh, with respect to the inside versus the outside at this equilibrium value. And this result is only true for one ion species. So if we're looking at more than one ion, this Nernst equation doesn't work. 
we can describe the Nernst equation for one ion at a time. So for example, we can look at the Nernst equation for potassium. We could look at the Nernst equation for sodium. We could look at it for any ion, but we only will look at it in isolation, not taking into account that other ions might be going through or diffusing across that membrane. Hope that's not too confusing so far and that's clear for you. I mean, we can actually do this calculation. So if you wanted to do the calculation for potassium, it would be the equilibrium potential for potassium is equal to um, RT uh, divided by the charge uh, Z, which is not shown here on this equation, uh, versus uh, Faraday's constant um, times the natural log of the concentration outside of the cell versus the inside of the cell for that particular ion. And the equilibrium potential for potassium um, on, for most cells would be about minus 90 millivolts. And this would be the membrane potential if only potassium ions were involved at the types of concentrations that we normally found outside the cell as well as inside the cell. But here's the thing, and here's the thing that we're gonna talk about in the next lecture. So the resting membrane potential when we measure it is never nine, minus 90 millivolts. It's actually closer to minus 70 or minus 80 millivolts. So the question would be there, what is happening? And how can we account for this? Now again, we get, get to this review slide, and this is an excellent way for you to go back over particular things. How much of this lecture can you remember just by looking at this review slide related to gated channels that we talked about, or about the membrane potential and this last equation, the Nernst equation, which we talked about that describes the equilibrium potential. So I'm gonna stop sharing my slides here for the moment or my screen for the moment and uh, turn that off, go back to uh, chatting with all of you in person. So that's a lot for us to cover. But here's this really interesting thing. We need to talk about this and it's a really exciting um, concept. So it's a little hard at the beginning and it means that you're gonna need you're gonna to have to spend a little bit of time going over this. This is a lot for you to cover in one lecture, so take it bit by bit if you can. Um, get questions, write them down, have them ready to ask. If there's points of confusion, things that are maybe not as clear for you, we do have time set up on Thursdays for you to ask questions. Discussion pages are also excellent, as I mentioned to you, sort of in the orientation slide that I gave you or that orientation video. Um, and I want you to understand why this is all important. So you might think the difference of minus 10 millivolts, surely that could be accounted by experimental error. Electrophysiologists and neurophysiologists are incredibly precise. And this difference of minus 10 millivolts might seem trivial to you, but it's actually a lot. And so we need to account for it. And in the next lecture that we go through, uh, whenever you have time, we're gonna start talking about why it's not minus 90, and it can't just be potassium that's moving, how else can we account for this difference of minus 70 or minus uh, 80 millivolts? Why is there that difference of uh, 20 millivolts that we're looking at? All right, so that was a lot to cover. Hopefully, um, you'll spend some time going through it. Please give me feedback. I have no idea because I can't see you directly. I want to get that feedback from you. Let me know how I can help you or what I can do more in these lectures um, and jot those down for me. Um, I'll try my best to make sure, do you want a floaty head sitting beside the uh, different lecture slides? Are you more comfortable just looking at the lecture slides? Is my voice too loud, too soft? Um, do you want me to use a different voice? You could do it, I could try to deepen it, uh, but please help me by letting me know what works best for you. All right, so I think we're just gonna say goodbye for now. Um, get those synapses working. Um, I'll see you in the next lecture series. All right, so take care.